Great, thanks so much, Charlie. So welcome to Beyond Grading, Shifting from Grades to Growth, presented as a collaboration with HP, Digital Promise, Intel, and Microsoft. I'm your host, Megan Pattenhouse, Learning Experience Designer for Reinvent the Classroom, and I'm joined by Kristen Palazzolo, Educator Engagement with Digital Promise. At Digital Promise, our mission is to accelerate innovation in education to improve opportunities for all learners. This means closing the digital learning gap, not only in access, but also in participation and powerful use. Digital Promise invests at the intersections of these stakeholder groups, educators, researchers, and developers, because we know that to realize tech's full potential, we must focus on amplifying human capacity. Educators must have every possible tool and resource to engage, motivate, and personalize learning with and for their students. Developers must be informed by education research and be supported by connections with practitioners to design products that solve salient challenges and improve student outcomes. And researchers must evolve new methodologies that produce results in a way that matches the speed of technology. To accomplish these goals, we believe in the power of networks, the sharing of stories from the field, support and investment in research, and an engagement in lifelong learning. Our networks bring together education stakeholders and critical conversations about pedagogy and educational equity. One of those networks is our Reinvent the Classroom program. In collaboration with HP, Microsoft, and Intel, Digital Promise brings together educators from across the US and Canada in our HP Learning Studios, HP Spotlight Schools, and HP Teaching Fellows. The schools and educators in this network exemplify Digital Promise's principles of powerful learning. These principles are built upon decades of learning sciences research and guide educators to design learning experiences that engage the hearts and minds of learners. Learning experiences that provide opportunities for students to deeply engage in their learning while using technology in ways that contribute to closing the digital learning gap. Powerful learning means that learning is personal and accessible, authentic and challenging, collaborative and connected, and inquisitive and reflective. And these sets of principles do not work in isolation, but are synergistic and mutually supportive. In today's webinar, you'll hear how our HP Teaching Fellows are leading powerful learning by rethinking grading and turning to growth. I'd like to introduce Anna Miller, eighth grade English and gifted teacher from Shelby County Schools in Alabama, Trevor Hlushko, middle years teacher from Regina Public Schools in Saskatchewan, and Monica Mormon, fourth grade teacher from Broward County Public Schools in Florida and her district's teacher of the year. Um, as we discuss how to move away from grading and focus on feedback and growth, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions in the Q&A feature of Zoom. Uh, this webinar is also going to be recorded for your future reference and posted to hp.com. So we know that grades are not the goal of school. What we really want is for students to learn and assessment is a key tool that helps us to understand where our students are and better personalize their instruction in order to get them to powerful learning. But we're also teaching within a system that's set up with grades as a metric of success. This is the case, even though we know that grades can actually work against learning. Research suggests that grades tend to diminish students' interest in what they're learning, when that reward from the learning is extrinsic rather than intrinsic, makes it less interesting and less motivating. They create a preference for the easiest possible task. So students see the objective of learning as getting a good grade, they will pretty smartly figure out um, the most efficient route to get there. And grades tend to reduce the quality of students thinking. If they're aiming for that minimum amount of work possible to reach that goal of getting the grade, they're missing out on a rich opportunity to engage in inquiry and curiosity, which we know drives a much deeper level of learning. So given that we're working in a system that usually requires grades and we're working in schools and communities who expect to see those grades, um, tonight is really about an opportunity to talk about what opportunities there are to kind of innovate inside the box, um, to borrow a phrase from George Kuros. Um, and I think that this year has been a great time to really think about um, what opportunities there are for us to move away from grades. The beginning of the pandemic, lots of places dropped grades. Um, as we realized that there were equity and access in issues, both in actually being able to access the learning and also in emotional readiness to learn because of all the trauma that was going on worldwide. Um, and I think that really led to a, an opportunity for us to realize that 
more than ever, we need opportunities to engage students in learning without the carrot and stick of a, a good grade on a test. And um, so I think that that is a great place for us to jump off in our conversation tonight um, to really think about how your mindset, or, mindset around grading has shifted this past year. Um, and I know I introduced you briefly, but it would also be great to start with a little bit more about you and your school community as you tell us um, how your mindset, mindset has shifted. And let's maybe start with Monica. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I teach fourth grade, um, a general ed setting um, in plantation. Um, I am in the sixth larger district in the country, Robert County. Um, and as far as my mindset, um, shifting it around grading this year, well, I will be honest, the COVID pandemic only highlighted my long time dysfunctional relationship with grading. I've always struggled having to produce grades at a certain rate, seeing the negative impact it had on my students. I always cringe at the beginning of the year when I hear my students ask a question whether an assignment is for a grade, which tells us so much how grading is perceived by them. While we as educators may not be able to change district grading policies, we do have the power to change how we approach grading. This year, I was reaffirmed in my thinking that learning is about an ongoing feedback rather than the punitive and definite grading. I definitely became more mindful of the language I use with my students where I strive to eliminate words like grading and scoring from my vocabulary. Instead, I communicate with my students using words like assessing, checking progress, uh, or monitoring growth. My assessments became more fluid and diverse in format where retakes are welcome within each quarter. My main takeaway in terms of grading would be to think about the words we use when we talk about grading, their connotations, and how we can modify the language we use in our classrooms to support our students' growth mindset when it comes to learning and growing. Thanks, Monica. And let's hear from Anna Miller. Hello, yes, I'm Anna Miller. I teach eighth grade gifted English. And then this year, because of the pandemic, I've also had all of the eighth graders who are doing full-time virtual school. And having both of those things, I've had to be very grace giving with myself and with my students, recognizing that things have not been as accessible for a lot of those kids. It's been very heartbreaking to make phone calls home and hear what they're dealing with on a personal level. And then to think of an A, B, C, or D assigned to that is, is very hard. And so it's because of the accessibility, I've wanted to give them grace and then in turn give myself grace. I agree with you, Monica, that the, the grading is something that I've struggled with for a long time. And then this year, I've decided that I'm gonna accept late work forever. And it's been really hard to not have a cutoff, but just recognizing I want them to demonstrate mastery. I'm not as worried about the minutia of it. Can you do the things that I'm supposed to make sure that you can do? And in English, that's, can you read and write and communicate? Um, this year, because of everything as well, I have, really leaned into the asynchronous and letting students choose more, which then in turn requires more flexibility with grading. If everyone's not taking the same test, everyone can't get scored in the same way. And so really leaning into more authentic feedback for the students that they can grow, so they can feel like they've demonstrated mastery and so that I can take that to my principal and administration and say, yes, they've mastered it and this is the evidence of it, which isn't always a number, but is always evidence to support that they're learning. Okay, and finally from Trevor. Hi everyone, um, my name is Trevor. I'm from uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. And uh, this year, uh, because of the pandemic, I've had the unique opportunity to uh, go entirely online and to uh, not just rethink grading, but rethink everything about how I did things in the classroom. And uh, it's been a roller coaster and it's been a, an exciting time because uh, it's all brand new. Um, what worked for me in the classroom as far as okay, hand this in and check this off and uh, these are the pieces that I'm looking for for assessment, um, those don't work online. And rather than just uh, automatically grading things and looking at things uh, 
that way I've had to change. And it's like, what works for one student online isn't going to work for the next one. So it's keeping it open and sharing and talking with the students and figuring out what works, uh, both for myself as well as for them, uh, which has completely changed grading as well. Yeah, I think that that um, parlays us very well into our next question. I heard themes of um, how are we figuring out what works for each student, um, particularly what kind of assessment might they need? I heard Monica talking about moving away from grading and more to assessment, um, helping students to really understand that it is a tool to help us help them um, and not a, are you good at this or are you not? Um, I, I also heard in Anna, you were talking about that mastery language, and I know we'll see some um, reflections from your students on how they're telling if they're getting to that mastery point, um, but really shifting from it being an external evaluation from the teacher to um, something that's more personalized. So how do you support learners in grading that is more personal and accessible? Uh, I believe that timely and specific feedback is everything. Um, I also make sure that my feedback is still inviting students' voice and that it is not authoritative in nature. Um, uh, working in a hybrid environment makes it challenging to have quick one-on-one -on -one feedback meetings with students. So I found a digital class notebook to fill that void as it enabled to, me to see my students' progress in real time, make annotations, and it also eliminated the need to resubmit assignments as students worked on improving the original document, which was an issue for my fourth graders um, at one point. Um, I also believe rubrics are a powerful tool as they enable students to understand way, where they are headed, what needs to be done to do well, and they also help students reassess one's product before submission using clearly defined parameters. Uh, I believe in the power of monitoring, guiding students along the way, which allows to troubleshoot ahead of time so there's no fear of, of failing. Um, I also believe in peer review. Pairing students to review each work, each other's work before deeming it ready for submission does appeal to many students. I also encourage share outs as a way to support each other and offer productive feedback. And of course, giving productive feedback is a skill that we develop over the course of the year. Uh, most importantly, I make my students know that submission of the assignment does not constitute definiteness, right? Uh, in my book, second and third chances or more are welcome. It gets tricky in case of summative assessments, uh, like chapter tests, right? If students fail the assessments, they are remediated and invited to retake the assessment. And I'm happy to remove that original grade and give them the one that they showed me after remediation. Thank you. Yes, Monica, I did something similar in our most recent poetry unit. I started because I have eighth graders, I gave them the state standards and said, these are the things that I hope for us to cover. And we worked through them setting kind of their learning path. How are we going to assess these things? How do you want me to teach these things? What tools do you want? What choices do you would like or would you like to see me provide to you? Um, and then as they completed these just formative basic assignments, I would give them feedback and then hand it back to them. But again, that wasn't the grade portion. They, it was just to help them. And it really freaked out some of my students who were so accustomed to the, the checks and the circles and the fraction at the top that showed what percentage they had learned. Um, but then to invite them into the opportunity to continue to revise it and then at the end, I had them pull their work samples and say, okay, this is what you did. This is what my feedback was. This is how you corrected it. And then to have that reflection, I felt like it helped um, the learners really take ownership of what they were doing it because it made it so very personal and it was tailored to each individual student. And I, I felt like as a whole, my students were able to understand this unit much better because of the accessibility to the feedback that wasn't a number, but was actual direct conversation about the things that they needed to work on and the things that they had done really well. And then to have them reflect on the end was definitely helpful for most of them as well to pause and think about it. Uh, for me, uh with our division moving to like an entire uh, to an asynchronous model uh 
it's allowed me to have a uh, more personal connection and like deeper conversations with my students about uh, what they were learning about. I was able to just give them big ideas and starting points and then build on their interests and to build on uh, what they're excited about and what they want to talk about rather than um, having a, a more of a one size fits all or like a kind of a set path that I would have had to uh, kind of gear towards more in a physical classroom. Um, and by making it, uh, checking in with them, like not only for uh, how are they doing, um, but how can I make this better? Is this working for you? Um, is this working for me? And being open and vulnerable with them and uh, sharing those ideas like, okay, we've never done this before. Let's make it better. Let's make it awesome. And to keep building on that. And uh, that's really made a big difference by just talking with the students as uh, as co-learners, as opposed to being just students and myself being a teacher. I love that idea of co-learners um, because this is definitely something where we're kind of going outside of the norm. There's not necessarily a clear roadmap for like, here's how to ditch grades and do something totally different. Um, so I think that that's a great model. It models for students that um, it really is about the learning. It's not about um, how you're being assessed or um, the grade. And I think that that um, also leads us into the point that um, if we take that grade away, um, it has to be something that the students are actually interested in. I think you've talked about some of the ways that you are personalizing that learning for students, um, but for students to truly care about their learning in the absence of the grade, um, it's really important that it is authentic and challenging. And so um, I know that's something that all three of you do really well. Um, is increase that authenticity and relevance for the curriculum. Um, so we'd love to hear a little bit about how you do that and what impact that has on the assessment and the grading. I think that student buy-in is an integral part of the effectiveness of, a, of the lesson. So how do we ensure that there is a buy-in, right? Um, I think it's crucial to create and cultivate culturally responsive classrooms. The content presented in the classroom setting should address everyone's needs and reflect everyone's identity. Um, we often look at the content that I present to my students from um, the perspective of voices. Um, I encourage my students to ask themselves whose voices are represented in the content that we are studying, whose voices are missing, why is it happening, why does it matter, and I invite them to change the original topic and make it their own based on um, their own identities. So to give you an example, if you look at the slide here, um, I looked the big, I, I took the big ideas for my grade fourth grade level. And for example, um, the, the topic of balance, which explores early explorations, Florida native tribes, etc. We wanted to make sure that we have a balanced perspective on this topic. So my students then, um, well, together, you obviously you guide them through the process, uh, but we wanted to look more specifically at the history of Thanksgiving. Uh, what does it look like from everyone's perspective? Uh, we wanted to learn about territory acknowledgements. Uh, we wanted to talk about the politics of early exploration. We wanted to look at Christopher Columbus from different angles um, as an explorer as an uh, indigenous uh, member, um, what did it mean to all these groups? Um, so I allowed students in the course of the year to add to the topics that are part of our curriculum. Uh, another point I think is very ex extremely ex important here is to empower students to curate their own content to increase their motivation and engagement. And if we look at the next slide, Megan, um, you will see an example of another unit we've studied about the refugees. Um, and again, I invited my students to think about the aspects of the topic that would interest them. And oftentimes we as adults, you know, forget about the things that kids are interested about um, and want to explore. So many of my students wanted to learn how do refugees in their camps, how do kids do they have access to you know the regular kid friendly activities so we wanted to, to explore that aspect of it um so i asked my students to look for content that we could add to our text sets and go from there um 
I also believe in student choice. I think we need to encourage students to show their individuality by choosing the format of their products. We need to equip them with tools, digital platforms to increase their selection of choices. Um, and I think it's also important to monitor their choices over the course of the year, evaluate them and make sure that they don't always go back to one choice. Uh, make sure that we encourage them to explore the ones that they have not used. And again, a few examples here, um, you will see my students presenting their text set to the rest of the class, justifying their choices. Um, and also um, this year we explored Minecraft education uh, edition where um, in this virtual reality, I think, first of all, it bonded us as a community. But second of all, it also enabled my students to use various digital platforms, Flipgrid, one of them, which I embed in Minecraft, where they can show a mastery of the content. Um, and finally, I believe in project-based learning and performance tasks. I feel it, these two proved to be a great and non-threatening way for my students to demonstrate their mastery of content in multidisciplinary format. Um, finding non-threatening ways to assess students' knowledge is such a powerful way to reach the same goal. I think that um, non-threatening ways to assess that goal, I think the Minecraft one is a great example of that, something that students are really inherently brought, bought into um, and is uh, something that they perceive as fun and exciting to do and don't necessarily even notice that that is a way that you're assessing um, how they're showing what they're learning. Um, Anna, what about for you? Through Digital Promise and the Teaching Fellows and this amazing professional learning community, I heard about the global goals. And in last quarter, I had my students look at them and just get familiar with all of them and then pick the ones that they were the most interested in to do some sort of project. And I left it very open-ended and a lot of my high anxiety students did not like that. But a lot of my students who had never had a chance to be passionate about something really thrived in researching why our community doesn't have a recycling program and what could we do to fix that? And how could we speak up for minorities who aren't able to have a voice, but they are, how can we um, lend and just have a more sustainable planet, obviously. And through those, I've seen now that everything we do continues to fall under that umbrella for them, that they'll send me articles or video clips that correspond with the global goal that they felt the most passionately about. And it's cool to see how what they were originally drawn to has now become this like authentic study outside of class beyond the assigned work, but they're intrinsically motivated to learn more about these things. and. I would much rather them be passionate about recycling than verbals. So I, I count that as a win, even though it's not a test question or a standard, it's being a better human being. And I think that those kind of authentic and relevant, meaningful conversations are ultimately the point of being an educator. Yeah, I think that that's the SDGs are a great um, strategy. Um, for pulling in that authenticity and that real world connection. I love that your students were coming back to that and pointing out connection to that beyond the fact. I think that is good evidence that they're authentically connecting to that material. And Trevor, what about for you? How do you um, build that authenticity and relevance of the curriculum for your students? I think I can build off uh, what has already been said. I, I, the value of student choice and the value of the uh, sustainable development goals and to then add to that uh, challenge-based learning. And this year has without a doubt been a challenge for, for everyone involved. And uh, with that though, it, there's the opportunity to, to look at the news that is so full of, uh, of topics that we can explore and connect to um, right back to our classroom. Um, I think of an old improv game that I used to play that's called Yes, And, and you just keep building on a story and going, yes, and then, yes, and then. So we look for the big idea in the news and we go, what are we trying to learn? Uh, so instead of looking at the community and why we decided to settle where we were, we look at, well, how has community changed because of the pandemic? How have our social lives changed when we're in a lockdown or when we're isolating or 
when we're not in a classroom that we'd normally have the social interactions. We've looked at health and go, okay, um, health is important, but what does health mean to us in the pandemic? And then we share ideas of, well, uh, this is important to my health and this, and my mental health has suffered and my physical health, I'm sitting at a computer all the time. And we've been able to explore that and act on that and to connect on like personal levels with my students. And to the point where it's like, I as their teacher didn't even think of that and they're coming up with this. Um, we can look at relationships and statistics and everything and just going back to the news and the big ideas that are constantly being uh, put out there has been really, really cool as far as uh, relevancy goes and making it authentic. Yeah, it seems like that idea of real world connection um, connecting to things that are in their everyday lives or things they see in the news is um, really important to building both that personal piece of it, something that they care about and something that matters to them. And it's also something that has an authentic audience. It, it is a um, problem that they can solve or something that they can affect in their own community um, or in the world that really helps them build that uh, intrinsic motivation rather than the extrinsic motivation of a grade. And we know that learning is an inherently rewarding and intrinsically motivating task, um, but we also know that learning cannot happen um, at the same time that you're doing some of those tasks that aid you in the learning and that really the learning happens when you have that opportunity for reflection on what that learning means to you, what you learned, um, that those are actually two separate processes in the brain. And so um, we're hoping to hear from you some of the strategies that you use for that reflection so that students do have time to internalize that learning and therefore be motivated um, by that learning process. Let's start with Monica. Oh, I agree. Reflecting is key and it does not have to be time consuming at all, but need, time needs to be set aside for students to think about their progress and growth. Um, I think it's so crucial to developing a learner's identity. Um, I embed self-reflecting questions in most of my assignments. Um, I think exit tickets are a great, great way to achieve the same goal. Um, and examples of such questions include, what was the most challenging part of the concept, the lesson? What worked? What didn't work? What could you have done differently? What did you learn about yourself in the process? Uh, and you'll be amazed at, at, at what student, how students see themselves as learners. Um, I also encourage a lot of self pep talk. I, I tell my students, guys, you are your own best advocates. Um, so um, yes, be critical about your progress, but also celebrate success and acknowledge that. Um, I conduct a lot of pulse checks, um, not only with my students, but with their families as well, which I think is crucial. Um, so I create um, quick surveys, um, that I um, do periodically with the families, um, where I give them a chance to share their perceptions on, on the remote, well, initially remote learning experience and then the hybrid, um, just to have an idea of you know, what's going on on both ends of the spectrum. Um, I also encourage my students to um, keep a track of their work uh, and pick the pieces that they're most proud of, not necessarily their best, work. Um, so we created like a semi portfolio system using OneNote class notebook, um, where uh, we also divided it by subject area, where students are encouraged to, um, again, add artifacts um, and their flip grips, uh, flip grid reflections throughout the year. Uh, so they have a nice finished product at the end of the year that they can share with their families. And these portfolios are also used during our parent conferences. Uh, students are always invited to these. Um, which is another great way to, to reflect. Yes, I have found this year, especially, it's honestly been more out of convenience for me is to have the students take the time at the end of our class each day to reflect on what we did, what questions they still had, what thing they learned, um, and then that way, when, because we had so many students in and out with exposure and quarantine of coronavirus. And so it was very helpful for them to be able to, if they came back 
to say, oh, what did we do yesterday? And the students had a written documentation of this is what we did Monday, and this is what I was still wondering, and to kind of be able to track their growth and to help out when students were coming in and out of the classroom. I also, um, at the end of each week, especially of this past unit, I would conference with each student and ask them um, what victories they felt like they had, how well they felt like they had done at whatever specific level of task we were working on that week, and then to set a goal or a challenge for the following week. And it was interesting to see my students pick more like executive functioning skills, um, going back to what you were saying, Trevor, about like mental and emotional health um, that was attacked during this past year um, and being able to communicate with my students on those reflections in a one-on-one -on -one setting that was very informal but was helpful for me to keep a documentation of what they had learned what questions they had and then how to move forward to continue to challenge them to learn more I just want to go back just briefly and hear a little bit more about some of the kinds of reflection questions that you had your students ask themselves, Anna, because I thought you had some great examples um, in that image. So at the beginning of the unit, I had them like set their goals of what they want, what they hope to learn, all that stuff. Um, but then our first poem that we read in this unit was I wander lonely as a cloud and we talked a lot about wander versus wonder and so then I thought I would I would verb our our reflections at the end of what are the things that we are still wondering um, and then at my weekly meetings that I had with the students I focused a lot on Bloom's taxonomy and I had them kind of build our school system has a bronze silver and gold level grading system um, that kind of matches up with Bloom's taxonomy. And so this particular week um, was that bottom understand and remember. And so I asked them, how did they feel like they did on that, that level? And it was interesting because I was trying to not give them a number grade and none of the students pictured here did it, but several were like, I did 75%. I was like, well, the, the purpose is to kind of reflect on how you did and not just the number um and then any questions that they had was mostly i'm constantly reflecting and i tell them that i have many skills but mind reading is not one of them so if you still have questions and don't tell me then i i don't know that you are confused and i can't help you um but yeah yeah i love the the opportunity for students to ask questions and make that more visible um, both to you as that could be a place to go in the future that you know is authentically motivating to them. Um, and then I also think it connected to um, something I think Monica shared earlier about being able to connect students. Um, I think Monica, you were talking about uh, as opportunities to give feedback to each other, um, but also being able to connect students who have similar interests or similar directions that they wanna go in their learning. So I really like that opportunity. Um, what about for you, Trevor? What are some of the um, strategies you use for reflection with students? Um, I, I really like that pink sheet, uh, and I think I need to borrow that from your you for mine. Um, but it, it that builds off of uh, kind of what I do, and I uh, I start out with uh, whenever I introduce a new idea or a new topic, uh, I have my kids do uh, an information dump, put as much as you know on into a Google Doc or a Word Doc or whatever it is to uh, see what you already know. And then then let's ask questions. And what do you think you need to know? And to build on their curiosity and their, and their wonder to go, okay, that's where we can guide it. That's where we can steer it. And uh, just to continually check in and go uh, along with them and go, okay, well, what do you still need to know? What have you answered? Uh, what have you learned? Um, what do we still need to find out? And when I was able to move away from just like, okay, this is a grade, it's to check in on them and go, Mr. H, I didn't get this, sec uh, this unit at all. Can you help me? And then to talk through it and to uh, look at it from a different angle to help them along the way. Uh, that's been really great uh, to, to do as well. 
So just continually questioning, talking, and uh, sharing what works and what doesn't. Yeah, I think there's some definitely some great strategies that you can implement tomorrow. I'm hearing lots of figuring out what questions students are asking, modeling for them, um, what questions they need to be asking or can ask. Um, because I think that inquiry really drives that intrinsic motivation. We are uh, by nature curious beings and we are driven to learn. Um, but a lot of times in our traditional systems, that's not what's valued and so students learn that they shouldn't do that or that they shouldn't share those questions. So I really love the strategies that you shared that really help them to build that skill and to share out what they're learning for their questions. Um, in that same vein of really building student skills, um, we talked about kind of working within the box that we're in. We're in districts that are giving grades. And so that's something that we are expected to do. Um, but I also know that each of you um, gives chances for students to build student agency throughout that process. Um, I think someone mentioned teaching students to be their own best advocate and to advocate for themselves. So what are some of the ways that we can teach that student advocacy um, when we do have to give grades? I believe that it is extremely important to help students develop and shape their own sense of self-advocacy. I find that elementary students often view the concept of their own progress and growth as something outside of their realm of influence, interestingly enough. They tend to rely on adult figures in their lives to monitor their growth and inform them about any red flags. So I make a deliberate effort at the onset of the school year and throughout to make students aware of their baseline status tools to use to be kept abreast of their academic progress and ways to best navigate their growth. I intentionally set aside time for my students to read my feedback, to check their current standing. I send them to our grading book and um, ask them, let's check all the subject areas, the assignments that you see, check what's missing, um, check where you stand and, and let's talk. Um, I set time aside to give them a chance to redo assignments and to discuss their progress. And as the school year progresses, I love seeing my students, you know, starting the discussions about their performance and speaking knowledgeably about their weaknesses and strengths. I love when students come to me and tell me, Mrs. Mormon, I don't understand. Can, can you sit with me and can we redo it? Can, can, can you please show it to me in a different way? Um, I see it as a compliment really, that they are vulnerable enough, open enough to share this with me. Um, at the beginning of the school year also, I create the baseline card for each student with an, an unknown summative assessment results. So prerequisites tests, diagnostics, last year's test scores. And then I have individual students conferences where students share their perceptions of their own academic standing, which interestingly enough, often does not align with the data itself. They don't know they are not so good in math or language arts. Um, and when you ask them, why? They, they don't know why. Um, so we look at the data and we formulate a plan for the school year, which we revisit, obviously, during the course of the year. I think naming one's strengths and weaknesses makes one's goals more tangible. If you break it down into smaller steps, it's doable. Being vulnerable enough to have an open conversation, and I think, Anna, you mentioned that word so many times, it's a conversation, right, Through, during the course of the year that we have with our students about their growth. So having the conversation about learning deficits or attitudes towards certain subject areas versus ability empowers students to be in control of their own learning process and makes the attainment of the goals more feasible. In our, at the end of our last unit, which was on poetry, they had several different options for that final summative in our district gold grade. And at the end of it, instead of them turning in their actual assignment to me, whether that was the essay or a series of poems they had written or some other creative option. And some of the kids work was so very creative. It was one of the best group of assignments I had seen in a long time, but I didn't have them turn that into me. I had them seek out people to get feedback and reviewers from and then reflect on the feedback that their reviewers gave them. And my, my line was that they had to be humans 
because some kids asked if their dog could review their work. And I said, that, no, they have to be humans, but it could be a parent. It could be a former teacher. It could be a peer. It could be whomever that they trusted. Um, and then the student was to advocate with their person and saying, these are the requirements and this is how I did them. And then in their reflection to me, which is what I looked at, was reflecting on that. Did you do the things you were supposed to do? Do you feel like you have mastered this material? Do you feel like you need to work more? And at the very end, I called them over. This was like a three or four week period. And we had done the weekly reflections and the weekly little mini conferences. And at the end, they brought all of their things to me and said, okay, bronze basic level. I believe I earned this many points out of this many points. And so this is the grade out of silver, this many out of gold, this many. And I told them, I'm going to put the grade that you tell me in the grade book. Cause I have to have grades per the system, but you have the chance to advocate for yourself. And I actually felt the opposite of what you were saying, Monica, almost all of my students, I would say two or three out of my 71 students I met with that day gave themselves the grade that I would have given them. They were very self-aware. They knew what they had learned. They could articulate how they learned it, what areas they needed to still improve on. And I had one girl who gave herself straight 100s that I would not have, but I told her that I'm gonna put in the grade you tell me because you believe this is a 100, so let's go. Um, and it was really cool to see their confidence grow. And now I'm looking toward next year and I want to do this kind of unit at the beginning to kind of set that as the tone of, you can advocate for yourself if you believe that this should earn a different grade than what I gave you, then let's let's have that conversation and figure it out so it's an accurate representation of what you know. I, I think the best way for me to kind of address this one is by telling a story. Um, right at the beginning of the year, I did a unit on mixtures and solutions and I, uh, did a live experiment for my students and I built it up uh, a week in advance saying, you're not going to want to miss this uh, uh, video, uh, be there, it's going to be awesome. And I go through the experiment and it doesn't do anything. Uh, it completely fizzled out. And uh, I, it was the highest attended uh, um, meet that I had. Uh, I had, I think I had 60 students out of 65 or uh, something like that. And it just completely flopped. And then I laughed and I, I took the opportunity because we are so used to the final product being uh, what's the graded piece that like, if we were to look at that uh, from a student point of view, they might go, oh, it didn't work so I failed, but I was able to open up the conversation and to go, sure, it didn't work, but what did I learn? And I shared with them what I learned and what I could do next time uh, in order to hopefully make it work. And uh, I'm, I'm lucky that I did that one right at the beginning because we were able to take that and build on that as we went uh, for the rest of the year. And it's, we looked at, it's like, it's not the end product. We learn so much um, and we only figure, and we can talk about it and share it in ways that uh, it's not just a graded piece. We can just talk through it and uh, have those conversations and share with each other um, what works and what didn't. And uh, when, when we think about it that way, we don't have to worry about the grades as much. We can learn uh, from the students where their levels are at and to go, yeah, I, you know what? I understand this now. Um, I know why it didn't work. And I know what I could think I can do next time. And we grow from there. Yeah, I think that that idea, coming back to that idea of us as co-learners with our students, that this is something that we are also learning alongside our students well, so we're modeling for them what it looks like um, at the same time that we're doing that learning ourselves, um, which I think brings us to uh, a piece that all of you have mentioned um, throughout today, but that you're learning alongside your students. 
Um, and as we just talked about, ref that reflection piece is really key to making that learning stick. And so what are some of the strategies you use um, for reflection on your own personal growth and professional growth? In my case, I feel like I'm reflecting constantly 24-7. Uh, sometimes it's a quick in between. Um, it's never, you know, an actual sit down at the desk and think about your day. Um, but I find myself continuously reassessing instructional materials that I use. What am I putting in front of my students? How current is this content? Again, whose voices are represented? Whose voices are missing? Um, does the content represent my student population? Uh, I also strive to find a network of fellow educators who inspire me to try new things. Um, I also seek out student feedback. Um, I ask them, you know, which activities worked? Why? Which activities were stressful? Why? What did you enjoy? Um, so again, being a fellow learner in the process uh, and being open and vulnerable to growing. Yes, I agree about asking for the students feedback in your reflection. My students know at the end of every unit, I'm going to send out a survey that is like, what was your favorite thing that we did? What thing would you hope that I never teach again or only to your worst enemy? And they always laugh at my extremes that I am like, do you feel like a master and you are basically a doctoral candidate or are you a homeless man living on the street because you never understood this concept? They're like, we, we want something in between Miss Miller. That's not very clear. Um, but inviting the students into that reflection portion and then letting them know that I actually take that feedback to heart and I change what I'm doing. I teach four classes in a row and they do not all look the same because of feedback that I get just in that moment and seeing their faces, what's working, what's not working, and then thinking, okay, last year all the students said to never do it this way, so I'm not going to do it this way. And then over the course of this past couple of weeks, month, I've been working towards a micro credential on customized learning paths. And so I've tried to be very intentional about actually sitting down and reflecting. And it was very scary. And one of my um, teachers at my school suggested just recording a video so I don't have to think about typing it up, but it can be very stream of conscious. And when I've gone back and watched them as I'm typing up my work for the micro credential that I'm like, oh, I have a lot of thoughts on these things that I have never really taken the time to sit and reflect on. And if I tell my students that they should sit and reflect at the end of every lesson, maybe I should listen to my own lesson and sit and reflect and pause because that's the only way we're going to continue to grow. And I think especially at the end of the craziest 18 months of education, thinking about the things that have worked and the things that haven't worked and some of the shifts that we've had in education have been great. And I'm really excited to see how they continue to grow. And some I will happily leave in the 2020, 2021 school year. I think I can take, uh, or I can connect with you there, Anna, about the recording a video or uh, moving through the challenge-based learning process with my students uh, also allowed me to kind of address challenge-based learning on my own point of view and to go, okay, online learning is my challenge and how am I going to uh, address this? How am I going to do it in order to make the most of it and to uh, have to make the most of it for my students as well? So every commute uh, from the school to home, um, both uh, in the morning and uh, in the evening, uh, my my rec audio recorder is going and i'm just talking to myself and going okay this worked this didn't this i'll do again this definitely needs to be reworded and it's it, it is an ongoing process and we uh and that's been really valuable for me to go back and to go hey this worked this worked this didn't let's keep going um and uh to reach out and to talk to other people uh both uh, in my division, as well as uh, outside of my division and outside of my province and outside of my uh, country to see, hey, have you tried this? Have you had success with it? Um, because for me, this is all uncharted. Uh, this is all brand new, um, which means it's, uh, it's super exciting because there's 
it's only growth. It's not a wrong way of doing it. It's just a, a way that we can improve. So. Great, and I think that's a great place to um, wrap up our conversation today is um, in that spirit of constantly reflecting and growing. Um, what are some of your growth goals around moving away from grades and focusing more on that feedback and growth? Trevor, just to piggyback on, on your response, I want to stress that I am an educator with 23 three years of experience and I still consider myself work in progress and I think it will never change. Um, now, as far as what I would like to implement in the future, um, I would love to continue to explore gamification as a teaching tool. Um, my students and I spent quite a bit of time this year in Minecraft Education Edition, working on various interdisciplinary projects. Our unit on the Everglades was a hit um, students created a Minecraft replica of the Everglades and I embedded various digital applications within for them to show their mastery. Uh, we had so much fun. I think it uh, brought us closer together as a community as well. Um, it definitely boosted engagement and enabled students to again present what they have learned using platforms of their choice um, as we embedded these various applications. So this is definitely a field I would like to explore more. When I first read the Case Against Grades article, I was very skeptical and I was like, there's no way anyone in the real world could actually do this. But after having done it for a unit and I've talked with my principal and I've talked with some of our instructional coaches and I'm hoping in the future to try to do more of these units. And even if it's not getting rid of grades entirely or going just to a, um, oh, what's the word when you have like the mastery and you're just like, yes, you've mastered it or no, you haven't. Um, but to embed these kinds of units in each quarter, but then also like, what if I didn't give that basic level bronze grade? Because that's an area that a lot of students struggle in of just doing that routine homework. They're very forgetful. They think that they already know it, so they don't need to. And what if I just allowed grace and said, do you understand and remember at this basic level? If so, what grade do you think I should put into the computer and moving on from there and taking it at a small step? So I'm hoping to just implement some more of that student advocacy, letting them really lead the learning and the grades that um, they feel like they deserve because and I am fortunate to have eighth graders who are close to thinking that they're mature, but they, they're able to vocalize what they've learned in a different kind of way. And I think that I could allow them to have more of a voice in that aspect. This year, one of my biggest focuses was to look at challenge-based learning as a way to make uh, online learning um, a powerful learning experience to uh, connect uh, what Digital Promise uh, is putting out there. And uh, the results that I got uh, were, were astounding and I really wanna keep that going and to go, okay, let's keep building this challenge-based learning and figure out better ways to make it uh, personal and accessible for my students, to make it authentic and challenging, collaborative and connected, and then uh, reflective and inquisitive for them. And uh, that's what I really hope to take uh, into the future. Great. Thank you so much for sharing your wealth of expertise and knowledge in your process of co-learning alongside your students. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions. Um, the first question was if uh, it seems like the feedback forms and examples that folks shared today were kind of a, were a hit. Um, and so we will work to get those, um, whatever folks are willing to share into the follow-up email that you received um, so that you can reference those again. Um, and then someone else is wondering, um, and I think some of you have kind of touched on this, but maybe you can expand a little bit on um, kind of what your assessments look like. Um, if you've moved away from quantitative grading, like giving an A, B, or C, um, to more competency-based assessment, assessments and portfolios. Uh, 
I have no choice, uh, but I have to give give letter grades uh, in my district. However, like I said, it's all about how you approach the whole process. And I do have a system of semi portfolios uh, where um, I track students' progress, you know, by standard, uh, by skill, um, and I, you know, we used a range of almost there, getting there, not quite there yet, versus numeric uh, equivalents. Um, so I guess I'm I'm doing both because I have no choice as far as you know stopping letter grading. Yeah, I think that that's a good example of kind of working within the system that you have. Um, as teachers, we don't necessarily have control over those district level policies. I think the point you were making earlier about being intentional about the language and about students knowing about the purpose of the assessment and meeting with them so that they understand those things um, can help kind of mitigate, push the, the grades to the back burner um, and bring the learning to the forefront. Anna and Trevor, anything to add on about um, what your, I think Anna, you were talking about um, your district has kind of a system of bronze, silver and gold. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that piece. Yes, so we, or they, I was not a part of that conversation, they decided that the, the basic understand and remember is bronze level and that's 10% of a student's overall quarterly grade. And then the silver component is 30% your quizzes, group projects, that kind of thing. And then the gold is what's remaining 60%. And that's your your major things. And I know for myself, even up until this point, before I have now had my mind totally blown about grading, um, I would try to make sure that those gold summative assessments were a variety of things. I teach English, but I try to make sure that um, we're writing one lengthy thing, whether it's a research paper or a story. And then I try to make sure that there's at least one test because some kids are just really good test takers and I don't want to penalize everyone because I was not a good test taker. And so I try to make sure there's one essay, one test, and then one outside of the box creative thing, whether that's a debate or a one pager or some other illustration. And it's been interesting when in these past two, nine weeks, I have, allowed the students, what, what creative choice do you want to do that would demonstrate this top level of Bloom's taxonomy? And my students have come up with better projects than I could have ever come up with. And so I have asked some of them if moving forward, I can just put those on my list of project options because who would have thought to compare all of the relationships in a Midsummer Night's Dream to flower meanings? I did not, but the student did an excellent analysis and it was a beautiful floral arrangement. So. I'm very happy with that. And I think um, giving the students more choice and then allowing myself to understand not doing your homework shouldn't cause you to fail a class if you understand the material and giving grace there and, and giving myself grace to not get caught up in the, the checking of the, the to-do list and the grade book boxes all filled, all neat. And, you know, just being flexible and continuing to grow and being a co-learner. For mine, it's a little bit different. We don't have A, B, C, and D in our, uh, in my division. We have uh, beginning, progressing, meeting, and then established. Um, and I think that that works really well with uh, kind of moving past just like a, a number grade or a percentage and whatnot. Um, because of how it's worded. So like, instead of a D, it's like, well, they're, they're beginning to get it, but they're not quite there yet, or they're progressing. And I, so I, I think for me, uh, how that's worded is really uh, beneficial to me. Um, so I don't have too much to add on that. Great, I think that that's a, a positive note to end on that um, while you guys are innovating within your classroom, it's also something that's starting to push up into the, the district level in terms of thinking about how we're talking about and framing grades for students. Um, I think we're out of time for more questions today, but I do have a solution for that in just a moment. Um, to wrap up, I did just want to highlight, um, I know Anna mentioned earning a micro-credential. Um, so these are offered free, uh, these particular uh, micro-credentials around um, creating assessments and customizing learning paths for students, providing formative feedback, really shifting that um, emphasis from summative assessment to formative feedback. 
Um, Micro-credentials allow you to demonstrate in a competency-based way the skills that you have um, so you can be recognized for those skills. So these will be included in your follow-up email if you're interested in learning a micro-credential. Um, this is a great way to get started. Um, and if you're interested in chatting more with our panelists, um, who I know were uh, very popular this evening, we are going to have a Twitter chat tomorrow. Um, you can find us at the hashtag reinvent the classroom. Um, so that will be tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So if you would like to pick their brains and learn more about what this looks like in their classroom, the whole Twitter chat tomorrow is going to be on grading. Um, so I think this is a great way to kick off that conversation. And we hope to see you all at that Twitter chat. Again, that's tomorrow at 7 p.m. Um, so thank you so much to our HP Teaching Fellows um, for sharing their wonderful knowledge um, and their co-learning with their students with us tonight. Um, we're very lucky to have them. Um, thanks to all of our attendees for taking this time out of your day to join us. Um, and we hope to see you all tomorrow at 7 p.m. for the Twitter chat. So thanks so much, everybody, and have a great evening.